Today, we will be giving you an update on Cardano. As many of you know, Cardano is a very exciting open source blockchain that leverages a uh, proof of stake mechanism like no other. Using the UTXO model, Cardano provides tremendous long-term viable rewards. Back in September of last year, we did our very first webinar on Cardano. Uh, since then, they had a major technical upgrade in fourth quarter, which has led to an increase in total volume locked, also launch of a new stablecoin pairs. In a minute, you will learn a lot more about this. Today, our speaker is none other than Charles Hoskinson. He needs no introduction. Many of you know who he is, the legend that he is. But to quickly summarize, Charles was one of the founders of Ethereum. He also founded Invictus Innovations. He is an absolute pioneer and thought leader in the space. We're truly thrilled to have him give us and you guys an update on what's going on at Cardano. The moderator for today's webinar will be my colleague, our head of digital assets consulting, Sean Farrell. Um, as always, there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can use you can ask a question using a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will send out replay information. And as always, on behalf of my partner, Tom Lee, and, my, and Sean, and all of my colleagues here at Bunstrat, thank you for your support and business. Feel free to uh, email us with any questions. Um, I will now turn the mic over to my colleague, Sean. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, definitely don't want to steal too much more time from Charles here since I know everyone's here to uh, listen to him give us an update uh, on the Cardano ecosystem but you know if we look back at uh, you know our initial report on Cardano I think uh, we saw three um, broad areas uh, for we'll call it improvement or growth uh, in the Cardano ecosystem one was around interoperability, um, you know, bridging between networks. One was uh, one pertained to developer relations. Uh, that was a very large initiative for IOG, the developer behind the Cardano network. And the other was stablecoins. The third was stablecoins. And um, as the cliche goes, bear markets are for building. And uh, you know, I think we've seen just that out of the Cardano ecosystem. And uh, to tell us a little more about what we've seen over the past few months, uh, we'll bring in Charles uh, to give us a lowdown. Uh, Charles, how are we doing? John, thank you so much for the invitation and give my best to Tom Lee. Uh, the last time I saw him in person, I think, was in Singapore. So we certainly do travel quite a bit. It's been a wild year, uh, actually wild quarter, I should say, for, uh, for Cardano. 2023 has been probably one of our fastest and best years in terms of development velocity and adoption. If you take a look at just some of the facts on the ground, uh, there's currently about 124 projects that have launched. 17 are launching Q2, uh, according to the reports that we've received from them. 7,783 smart contracts are on the system. Uh, TBL has, I believe, doubled and transaction volume continues to increase. Uh, some of the key drivers of these metrics are things like the launch of JED, um, uh, which is the first algorithmic stablecoin on uh, Cardano that uh, was based on a design that we cooperated with several academic partners on, and it was taken by an Israeli company, a regulated company called Cody, uh, and they launched. And that continues to grow and evolve. Uh, there's also just a lot of refinements and iterations of Cardano applications as a result of the Alonzo hard fork, uh, excuse me, the Vossel hard fork last year, which upgraded a lot of the Plutus capabilities from the Alonzo fork. Uh, so people are starting to upgrade to Plutus V2, and they're seeing, in many cases, 5 to 10x improvements in efficiency uh, for throughput speed and uh, cost reduction uh, with their applications. Uh, Hydra is uh, coming to mainnet here in just a little bit. For those of you who don't know, Hydra is a kind of a layer two solution that we built as middleware for dApp developers to basically integrate into their dApp, and it's kind of like their own little private lightning network, uh, it, but it takes advantage of a lot of the capabilities of extended UTXO that you don't really have in normal UTXO systems like Bitcoin. Uh, what this will do is just simply make things better, faster, and cheaper for uh, Cardano applications. In addition to that, we've been working real hard to get Mithril to mainnet. 
Uh, we anticipate that occurring sometime Q2, Q3 as a reference for Cardano wallets. Uh, what Mithril is going to be used for this year is uh, two different dimensions. One is an accelerator for full nodes, so they can uh, parallel validate epics, which effectively translates to a dramatic speed up in in uh, in uh, wallet rest and uh, wallet um, recovering a full node. So when you download a full node, you need to sync through the entire full node sequentially. But you can actually with Mithril go parallel. So if you have a lot of processing threads, you should be able to process a full node very quickly. So the exchange people will really love that. And anybody using it uh, who needs a full node, like blockchain explorers and others, are just kind of really excited about that. But the more consumer-friendly application is the use of Mithril as a technology to uh, ensure that light wallets have full node security. So effectively, you get a lot of the things that Mina and uh, Cello and other people that are in that space of high security, lightweight wallets uh, and that's just going to be a standard that we roll through. A lot of work has happened on standards overall for smart contracts throughout the Cardano ecosystem. And so there's uh, ample working groups talking about DAP certification. This is a vote topic because people don't like their money stolen and they don't like their smart contracts broken. And one of the unique advantages of the development stack and model and process that we've chosen uh, as an ecosystem is to be amenable to formal verification. So we have a much easier time in our ecosystem talking about how to improve the quality of smart contracts written in our ecosystem to make sure that nothing gets stolen and make sure that they're semantically correct and they have other desirable properties. Uh, So uh, a lot of great work there that's being done through a multi-agent standards process. So there's groups of people that are coming together uh, on the horizon, not necessarily near, but midterm, meaning this year, uh, we have the formation of an MBO, a members-based organization, to aggregate all of the different development interests because we have quite diverse group. Uh, you have your real five people that worry about DeFi in Africa. You have uh, generic DeFi like DEXs and oracles and stable coins. Uh, you have NFTs. Uh, you have core protocol constituencies. You have the stake pool operators, and all of them are kind of in different fragmented views and provide different views and requirements for where the protocol needs to evolve and what ancillary software needs to be developed for the protocol. So uh, given that there are so many people that are running around, it made sense to try to drag them all into one members-based organization so that steering committees can form to help get more roadmap clarity and to help organize uh, more consistent releases that are more commercially viable for everybody. So there's a large working group that's putting together an MBO. We've already made several announcements this quarter about uh, the, and last quarter about the MBO. And uh, my hope is to have that operational before the end of the year with uh, a reasonable amount of funding uh, behind it. And then it'll be like the Linux Foundation or other organizations that tend to aggregate commercial interests uh, funded through members' fees and uh, conferences and other events. Uh, SIP-1694 is perhaps the biggest and most meaningful and significant work item in our ecosystem, um, and that is complete end-to-end on-chain governance. Uh, We have had, as uh, the Cardinal community, many workshops on this. Uh, There is a SIP. SIP, for those of you who don't know, is the unit of change for Cardano. So Bitcoin has BIPs, stands for Bitcoin Improvement Proposals. Uh, SIPs are Cardano Improvement Proposals. Uh, So 1694 is the SIP that is related to on-chain governance. And what this effectively does is not only creates a governance class in the system, they're called DREPs, uh, but then it also unlocks the full Cardano treasury, which is about 1.5 billion ADA at the current market price, uh, a little um, over five, six hundred million dollars of value. Uh, So that's a very substantial pool of resources that will now have a complete on-chain governance system to be able to deploy for things like growth hacking, protocol development, marketing, and other such things. Uh, So this has accumulated over the years through block fees and transaction fees since 2017 when Cardano turned on. So it's a nice nest egg, almost like a sovereign wealth fund for the ecosystem to use as it sees fit to help the ecosystem grow and manage its growth. Um, Also, having a governance class means that we can get better representation of the needs of all the different diverse users inside the ecosystem. But obviously, building an on-chain governance is a very significant affair. Uh, So there's a humongous team of over 100 people from many different organizations working together in tandem uh, to ensure that we get that done correctly as an ecosystem. And we're following a a very inclusive process. So the first major workshop was held here in Longmont just a few weeks ago. Uh, It's going to be followed up by dozens of community workshops on five different continents. And then they're going to aggregate together to a closing workshop in July. And hopefully that'll ratify the, uh, the final candidate 
and then that can be voted on by the community and then can integrate it into the system overall. Uh, so there are other things on near horizon or mid horizon that uh, we're quite excited about. A uh, lot of great progress has been made with our sidechain strategy, and we think we'll have some wonderful announcements towards the end of the year, come November with the uh, with the, the Cardano Summit uh, that the foundation's hosting, I believe, in Dubai. Uh, and, and there, it's basically how does one build a sidechain? So what type of tooling and kit is in place, and how does that get launched? And so competitors in that class are things like IBC with Cosmos or parachains with Polkadot, uh, so obviously Cardano needs to have a, a solution, a step forward. And we think we've come up with uh, collectively a really good idea, especially as it relates to the sidechain that IO is working on, which is called Midnight, which is a, a comprehensive privacy play. A um, lot of optimizations continue to be made. Plutus version three is, is under development at the moment. Uh, hopefully it'll be just as meaningful as Plutus V2 was last year with the Vossel hard fork. And again, just better, faster, cheaper, smart contracts, better development tooling, better development experience, and more lessons learned from uh, the people deploying on Cardano. Uh, educational programs recently got launched by the Cardano Foundation, including a certification program for uh, people who want to be uh, Cardano developers. Uh, and uh, Plutus Pioneers cohorts continue to grow. I think we've had over 8,000 students uh, in, that, uh, in that total system. And uh, we're in fourth or fifth iteration now, I can't recall. New languages are coming to Cardano as well. Our first low-code, no-code language called Marlow should be launching next quarter. Uh, and that is really cool because it's a, a very simple paint-by-numbers language. And the first major use case is an NFT builder, but it was actually modeled after FPML and the Actus project. FPML, Financial Program Modeling Language, is commonly used by banks and people in financial services. Uh, and that language is really meant to construct complex financial contracts, but kind of like a you know, SQL to databases or HTML to the web presentation, it's a domain-specific language that makes it very easy to do very complicated things. So uh, inculcating that with uh, a strong base and a very practical use case, NFTs, which actually are surprisingly complicated in terms of financial flows, including intellectual property, it's a good way to grow and build some adoption behind that stack as it gets into more complicated financial arrangements like security tokens or DeFi. In addition, we're also exploring how to connect at Marlowe to GPT. Uh, code generation is becoming an increasingly vogue topic and having a low-code, no-code solution that can work with an AI assistant, uh, similar to kind of how Microsoft is envisioning where Copilot is going, uh, I think is going to be tremendously helpful given that that's an exponential technology. By this time next year, we feel that uh, that's going to be a perfect companion for helping people write really awesome smart contracts and test and validate those smart contracts. So we wanted to get ahead of the curve uh, as an ecosystem. We also have a very strong identity play as well with Atala Prism. It's entering version two. Many of you know we are on schedule with the Ministry of Education program. Over a million users already uh, are being onboarded uh, this year and the remaining four million for that deal with MOE will be onboarded next year. Uh, Prism uh, just released its version two and we're looking to open core that model and we're in discussions with a very large open source foundation, uh, but we can't quite announce because it hasn't concluded yet, to take over the governance of the open core of it uh, and help with commercial adoption of it. And then obviously we'll use Prism across the line. This could be everything from regulated value transfer protocols to uh, you know working with KYC and AML situations to enhancing wallets for estate planning and recovery. We have a broad spectrum of applications that we're quite concerned uh, about that desperately need an identity solution, and crypto really only gets good when identity can meet crypto. So all in all, it's been just a tremendous year of growth. We're still in the top five in terms of development velocity. We're usually in top three in terms of transaction volume for value, uh, according to Masari's uh, index. Uh, and uh, we continue to see great growth in TVL, great growth in uh, dApps and DeFi in the ecosystem and a lot of really wonderful things on the horizon, like further advancements of JED and uh, the things that I've mentioned before. Uh, and uh, the roadmap certainly is coming together, but I'm absolutely most excited about governance. This is the age of Voltaire and really seeing SIP 1694 come into fruition means that we've unlocked the potential of thousands of people across the world to directly participate in growing the ecosystem. And we're unlocking a fund of 1.5 billion ADA uh, to be able to, like a sovereign wealth fund, grow the uh, common good. So it's uh, real cool to see that uh, go from 
a whiteboard to reality, and uh, hopefully that plane can land pretty soon. So that's uh, all I have for the quick, quick rocket update for you, Sean. I'm more than happy to answer your specific questions. Great. No, it was a phenomenal breakdown. Uh, I think we definitely have a lot to unpack there. So I guess may- maybe first, uh, not to step all the way back, but for perhaps the people who are joining us for the first time or new, uh, could you give us the 10,000 foot overview of IOG and their role in the Cardano ecosystem? Well, what's nice about things like the members-based organization at SIP1694 is it really gets everybody into the right roles and right buckets. So Input Output, we're a development company. We're an engineering protocol design and science company. So we write academic papers, we design protocols, and then we write the code to actually bring them to bear. And that could be everything from dApps, for example, JED, we kind of figured out how to design that, to uh, full-on protocols like Cardano, for example, or Midnight, where you're actually doing something very specific. We have from time to time also got involved with things like community management, marketing, governance, uh, where necessity uh, facilitated that. Uh, But as we go through this year, IOG is really going to supercharge its development side and work a lot more on new product development to build products on Cardano. For example, we're creating a real fi company in Africa, and that company is going to focus a lot on remittances of microfinance and really trying to tie together a lot of concepts like stable coins, blockchain-based settlement, uh, blockchain-based identity and credit, and be able to unlock a lot of illiquid microfinance marketplaces and combine them together, and then take regulated products in the West and combine them together. That's a specific product. And now that Prism is getting mature, Cardano is getting mature, and our other parts of the ecosystem are getting mature, we're about ready to open up products like that in jurisdictions like Kenya with partners who are regulated. And these are the kinds of things that we're going to focus on. In addition, we'd like to build side chains on top of Cardano to add more capabilities to Cardano. The most significant example of that is Midnight, where Midnight doesn't have a native privacy solution. But as you increase the level of regulation of these products, you increase the level of collection of personally identifiable information, which means you increase the demand for privacy. So over the next three to five years, you do need to have great privacy solution. So it turns out that the same type of development that's happening with rollups could potentially be reused uh, to enhance privacy as well. And if you have a private smart contract stack and you put those components together, you're in a really good position to survive regulated finance, regulated DeFi, these types of things moving forward. So these are the kinds of things that we would like to work on, uh, but there's still some backlog in uh, general Cardano things. And uh, what we're going to do is take that backlog and put it to a bespoke company uh, and have that bespoke company as a subsidiary of IOG basically service that while we have other bespoke companies that are in their own companies, uh, their own buckets, uh, basically pursue new product development and build that into the Cardano ecosystem. So we're a very diverse organization. At the very top, we kind of look like an incubator accelerator. And then on the tentacles, each one of them is special purpose for something, whether it be Lace, our wallet that we just released uh, and uh, trying to make that conquer the Web3 world to be multi-chain or it be Prism, our identity stack, or our infrastructure company, which will continue working on protocols and doing engineering, or our research group that does a lot of grant-funded research with university partners, or it be uh, what we're doing with RealFi in Africa. All these things are different concerns, and they aggregate up to IOG. Understood. Now, it's a good breakdown. You've, you mentioned the word, the term RealFi a couple times. You know, I think everyone's really familiar with uh, TradFi, DeFi. There's a lot of FIs out there. Um, but Cardano, IOG, um, I'm always hearing the term real fi out of that ecosystem. Could you maybe unpack that? What, what does that, what does that mean? So real fi is a term for basically upgraded DeFi. And so you have DeFi, we kind of have a notion of it, but the problem is DeFi lacks standards, certification, metadata, identity, governance, and regulation. Yeah, so every one of these DeFi applications, they kind of backfill these things in on a case-by-case basis, but there's no ubiquitous concern of what is required in order for DeFi to be compatible with TradFi. So traditional finance, they have all the money. There's trillions and trillions of dollars, and they're real excited about the potential of what DeFi can bring, especially in creating one global market and also figuring out the ESG side of that, the $150 trillion concern. But on the other hand, They got regulators, they got compliance departments, uh, they have all kinds of unique concerns that DeFi was never built to accommodate. Why? Because it was built in a vacuum. 
by young people who would never run a compliance department. Uh, so the question is, how do you bridge those two things? And you do it through governance and identity and metadata and these other things, but you can't just say it, you have to show it. So what we're doing is we're picking a very particular use case, in this case, microfinance, which is very understandable for most people in the financial industry, and saying, how do we upgrade the way microfinance works today and put that into the 21st century, put that into the blockchain space and show end to end how TradFi will connect into it and do it in a way that is compliant, but at the same time manages the principles that we've come to know and love in the cryptocurrency industry, like uh, economic identity, belonging to the edges, self-sovereign identity, these types of things, uh, users owning their own data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of our idea of real fi. And throughout the year, we're going to be kind of exploring and testing that. We just call it real because it's real finance. You know, the problem with a lot of DeFi is it's not really that real. It's a lot of yield farming and trading and these weird names and extremely high yields that seem ponzilicious. Uh, and we we can't really wrap our head around it in most cases because it's obfuscated on purpose. Real Fi to me is just saying it's real people, it's real finance and in real places. And what we're trying to do is take the technology that we've invented and make the onboarding cost really low, make it 24 seven, make it high liquidity and ultimately make it global. Charles, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, we get off this call and there's a meme meme coin launched called Ponzilicious. Ponzilicious. Quit the uh, <laughs> quite, quite the adjective. Um, so, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Are you something that I think has taken shape on other blockchains within other networks is uh, you know a name service which in its ideal state kind of services this need for identity, right? Uh, have we seen projects that uh, service this this yeah. need on Cardano? Yeah, we have Ada Handle and there's um, others that are doing that. It's a very old concept. I've been in the cryptocurrency space since Namecoin was a thing. Uh, so it's uh, everything old is new again. But, you know, you have to go beyond just a name service. And you have to really think carefully around the orchestration of identity and how that gets connected to financial transactions, applications, and dApps. So this is why we built Prism, and it, it's a compliant framework that follows the DID standard. I think it's the only one that has end-to-end -end adherence to all the standards that have recently come out. And we're also looking at an, emerging standards like a non creds for example, uh, so the integration of zero-knowledge cryptography to that. And so once you've combined that, it's very trivial to create a namespace in a system, but you have something that's far more important which is your leasing system, your revocation system, and the management of that namespace. How we tend to do it in the XDoc 509 web certificate uh, PKI world that we're used to with web domains is we just trust ICANN and we just trust a root authority and they figure it out. Well, that doesn't work so well if you're in a completely decentralized uh, ecosystem uh, and you want to avoid the sins of the old school days of the web domains. You don't want people sitting on a domain name. You don't want people who are not producing anything with that agency or impersonation, for example, which is a major issue in the internet as it stands today, especially in social media with the giveaway scams, for example. So I think somewhere between technologies like Ada Handle and, and these other things that have kind of built out the Cardano ecosystem, which are community-led, combined with what we're doing with Prism, combined with what we've been doing in the zero knowledge space at our lab at Edinburgh with the Midnight Project and just looking at standard space programs like with the W3C, when these things combine together, I really do believe that we can build a, a wonderful system. But what's the point? Well, the point is that you have an identifier where you send money to a name instead of an address. You have an identifier where you have a system where you can prove facts about a person without revealing their personal identifiable information. For example, are they a US citizen? Are they a taxpayer? What state are they a resident of? Are they over the age of 21 for purposes of gambling or drinking or whatever? Um, uh, is this person uh, an accredited investor so that they qualify for Reg D exemption? These are the kinds of things that I like to ask. I don't want to be in the position of, give me all your documentation. I have to know everything about you. Go through everything and have a guy figure out whether you're suitable or not. I'd like a proof where I can show it to an auditor and say, according to the proof, it's okay. And here's the audit trail, but I don't actually have the personally identifiable information myself or not. I think that's where the rubber meets the road and where the maximum value is produced for people and it changes roles and responsibilities. And I think we're going to be a leader in that because we've carefully thought about the privacy side, the credential issue inside, and how that's going to integrate with uh, the blockchain component. Yeah. 
No, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and to your point, it, it's I, I agree. It's it's it, the DeFi ecosystem becomes very circular, right? If there isn't a link to real world assets, right? Um, and one of the major links, obviously, that we've seen on other networks is um, via stable coins, right? The, the largest real world asset on chain is the U.S. dollar. Um, and you mentioned a couple times the launch of Jed. Um, it's my understanding that Jed has a very unique uh, model, not the typical over collateralized stable coin that I think we're accustomed to seeing. Could you maybe just speak to the Jed model and, and how it works? Well, Jed basically is an over collateralized stable coin, and there's some tuning algorithms in it. And the question is, that we're exploring on the academic side right now is how do you do two things at the same time? So how do you improve the economic efficiency of the token itself, meaning that the level of collateral that's required can be dynamically lowered so that it's not over collateralized? Right now, JIT's playing it safe. It's like eight to one. Um, and we would like to see, can that be smaller and better conditions? And, and thus, you have more economic efficiency for the creation of the stable coin. But then also, can you improve the opportunity cost of the creation of the asset and the holding of the asset. The problem with staking systems is their positive carry. If you have ADA and you use ADA, um, it, you can participate in the staking. And if you're a stake pool operator and you get it done, then you make some money. So you get a return. Well, that means that if you take your tokens and use it in a different context and they're not staked or there's inefficiency in that process, you may actually make less on average than just holding ADA. So it's not a rational decision to get into that coin. So there's been a lot of discussions about how do you create an ecosystem where the returns are more proportional with the risk of the of the viewpoint. So this is an ongoing research program, but what's really cool is there's guys like Jan Schlegel and Phil Lazos from Oxford working on it as are uh, others from Cody. And there's a lot of great, wonderful progress that's being made. We have an enormous amount of economic data. So it turns out that the pendulum is really far on the safety side. So Obviously, it has gone down from three dollars to thirty some cents, and yet peg held at a dollar. So it looks like the algorithmic stablecoin is doing its job. And the evidence we have from a sister coin that's based on a similar design, uh, which is er Ergo's uh, Sigma UST, also shows surviving very catastrophic market events. Uh, but it's still a very inefficient asset, and it needs to improve that efficiency. And there's a lot of work that's being done there. There's another direction too of what does that collateral pool need to look like? Uh, so right now it's just an ADA collateral pool, but what if you go multi-chain, multi-asset? So you have collateralization from Bitcoin, collateralization from Ether, collateralization from a diverse collection of assets, even stable coins themselves. It's a much harder problem going from one to N and figuring out the weighting of that pool in an algorithmic sense, because you don't want a human being managing it like they do in other algorithmic stable coins. Uh, so these are some of the things that the team is is working carefully on and uh, discussing with partners. And what we do is we look at it much like Hyperloop to uh, Elon Musk Hyperloop to its commercialization partners, where we write the paper and design the protocol, but the actual launchers of that are third-party independent companies. In this case, Cody with uh, with Jed. Um, the other th side of it is just kind of a meta question of are there impossibility theorems and and the design of a stable coin, an algorithmic stable coin, what can you do, what can't you do? It's a great academic exercise as much as it is a commercial exercise to design one of them. And under what circumstances do you run into bank runs and Luna style events? So you can avoid those circumstances by being very inefficient, but then by being very inefficient, it's too expensive to create the product. So you, you have to kind of figure out where that pendulum needs to be and how do you get an algorithm to balance it? It's quite complicated. Indeed, Charles, indeed. The uh, algorithmic stablecoin is probably the white whale of the crypto economy, I would say. But we have to get there because if we don't, it's the back door upon which cryptocurrencies uh, have no autonomy. Yeah, because if we, we, we want to use these as payment systems, credit systems, we want to use these as financial systems, if all we've done is the, the, the primary value carrier is a asset-backed stablecoin issued by a bank, why do we even have crypto? Because at the end of the day, it's just basically a bank's coin or a CBDC. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so if this, if you're super serious about crypto, you have to be serious about self-sovereign identity and you have to be serious about 
algorithmic stable coins because yeah. the two things where control gets introduced into the system. And I agree more, Charles. Um, so I want to remind everyone watching that you can drop your questions in the chat um, and I'll try to get to all of the good ones. Um, you've discussed uh, side chains a couple times, Charles, and uh, this actually stuck out for me too. Uh, I know in prior conversations we were very focused on uh, layer two scaling via Hydra. Um, I understand the first Hydra head was open the past quarter. You could dive into that if you'd like. Um, but I guess the, the broad question here is, um, will Cardano use ZK rollups or other L2 solutions for scaling? Um, why is there no data availability layer for Cardano? And what's the decision process to really, um, uh, lean into side chains for scaling? Okay. So, uh, it's a misnomer to say we have no data availability. There are things like reference inputs or these things, but, uh, they're not like Algorand boxes or Celestia's attempt to build a data availability layer. So it's fair to say that uh, it's a very restricted DA layer over what people would want. Uh, and we're not opposed to data availability. The question is, how do you solve it in a way that is sustainable over a five to 10 year horizon? So what you don't want to do is naively just store everything on a blockchain that nobody cares about and create no economic agency for it. And then suddenly you have a, a petabyte blockchain because people are using it as a database. That's, that's a very bad misuse of a scarce resource. And a lot of the things that na naively are approaching this problem, they're moving in that direction and it's leading to mass centralization of the system or a harder problem, which is how do you shard the data set? So uh, what we're gonna do is I think a three phase plan and uh, those three things together, I think are gonna solve a lot of problems. One, having a robust sidechains ecosystem means that you could build data layers as a sidechain. So you could create a file coin on, for example, Cardano and use that as a persistent store. Uh, and that becomes the de facto thing that dApps use. So that's like a, like a sidechain dApp oriented solutions model and you're letting the community build pluggable infrastructure. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to see where that goes, but that's a, a long horizon, like more than a year. Um, if you take a look at the second plan, uh, we do intend on having rollups on Cardano. And so the question is how do you align that? And so you get the best bang for your buck uh, with things like what we're doing with Midnight. So we've looked at uh, a lot of different curves, in particular pasta is one that we're very interested in. And we think that there's a lot of merit there, but there, there needs to be a, a lot of careful consideration of implementation complexity and how that actually works its way to mainnet. Every time a script operates on Cardano, there's a time budget for how long that script takes to execute. The more complex the curve structure that you have for a rollup and the more that you'd like to make trustless in that rollup, the more complicated it gets to get all that done in that time budget, or else you have to introduce new artifacts like intermediate calculations or script pipelining or these types of things. So we have some pretty good plans, and I think it's very likely that whatever solution, because Midnight's going to be a roll-up native system, that whatever Midnight uses uh, will be ported to Cardano as part of an overall sidechain's play and used as a checkpointing system for uh, sidechains. So it'll improve security, but then it also could be reused for a litany of other things. Well, this gives you access to a lot of really cool things like recursive snarks, but it doesn't give you a semi-persistent data storage layer. That's the third thing. So if you look at Mithril certificates, you look at Hydra, you look at where input endorsers are going in the requirement of having a large mempool, you're getting to a point where you need to take a replicated resource and make it distributed, namely the semi-persistent storage in the system, save for pub sub inside the system. So basically what happens is that you need a workspace where you don't intend it living there forever, but you're queuing it up for a period of time. Like for example, I wanna send Sean a message, he's not available right now, so I'm just gonna put what I wanna send him right here. So I have to naively broadcast it over the network again and again until he logs back on. And if he doesn't, well, you have to pay rent to live in that layer and it goes away at some point, kind of like a warehouse or something like that. Well, it turns out you can create that. And if you create that, that would resolve the vast majority of data availability questions that people tend to have. Um, and also could actually act as a subscription layer basically for dApps to subscribe to their users, to each other, and negotiate state between each other. So we're pursuing all three of these in parallel. There's a lot of work going on with Spiros at University of, uh, affiliated with our guys at University of Athens. Uh, he's the guy who designed PolarCast, which is a decentralized pub subsystem from the early 2010s. 
uh, and he's doing an update looking at semi-persistent storage in a blockchain contest context. We're looking at technologies like RAM Cloud, which Stanford came up with around 2015, uh, and a collection of other things along that vertical, because we're doing it out of necessity for the workflows that we have for Hydra and Mithril and all the other things we want to do. We are definitely going all hands on board with um, with rollups, and we're looking very carefully at what is the best tech to bet on, just not now, but the future, and how do you do upgradability? And obviously, we're pursuing a very aggressive sidechains view, and there is definitely going to be a market for the storage. And somebody's going to want to build a storage sidechain at some point. So they're all interconnected to each other. Um, and uh, they're just all things where you have to kind of create a coherent vision and you have to understand you don't have a one size fits all thing. Because if you bet on that thing, you have to live with all the trade-offs of that thing. And usually those trade-offs involve centralization of the system or a reduction in the amount of resilience of the system, especially if there's a security flaw in that thing or a protocol flaw in that thing. And this is too important of a topic to bet all the farm on one approach. Life is uh, just a constant series of decisions about trade-offs, right? Right. Um, so on on the topic of side chains, I understand that in EVM side chain, EVM compatible side chain was launched. Mm-hmm. Um, I assume that's an exciting development is, you know, have you seen any increased developer traction, uh, given that, you know, EVM working with EVM is probably more, um, requires less, uh, less effort to bring a developer up the curve, so to speak, than, you know, learning Haskell programming language. Yeah, so Cardano was always intended to be a polyglot ecosystem, which was always so funny when we see developers criticize it. And they say, oh, well, you know, Haskell, nobody knows that. They can't use it. Well, so, well yeah, but we have multiple programming languages. So obviously you can pick what you want. So there are two EVM sidechains on Cardano right now. There's a proof of concept that was developed called Mamba, and that was built to test our bridge mechanics. So the sidechains team right now is writing smart contracts to be able to move value from one system to another system and also test the control mechanics. So how a state pool operator would sign up for a smart contract to manage multiple chains at the same time. So Mamba was never meant to be a production chain. It's a testing chain specifically to test the sidechain mechanics. And then there's a production chain that was created by DC Spark called Milkomeda. And Milkomeda actually already has customers. For example, Wing Riders runs their infrastructure on it. And there's a bridge for Milkomeda to Ethereum. And that bridge allowed stable coins to go back and forth. Um, also, they're planning on deploying their game engine, Pima, on that. Uh, so there's already adoption there. And uh, it is the case that through a lot of the work that they've done, you're able to call EVM stuff from the Cardano mainnet. So if you're interested in building a commercial application uh, that is EVM compatible, uh, Milkomina is the approach. Uh, if you're involved with us in building out kind of the sidechains model, uh, then uh, Mamba is is the approach for that. Now, what's going to happen is we're right now working on a sidechain framework. Uh, it's like a toolkit. You know, everybody's got it. Cosmos has one. Polkadot has one. And that will have a whole plugin ecosystem. And one of those plugins will be an EVM engine. So it's very easy then for people, if they want to do EVM, to add that capability to the sidechain that they construct. Um, but yeah, we've noticed a few come over, but the problem with EVM porting three years ago was quite easy because there was one play in town, it was Ethereum, everybody was trying to get off and they were looking for the best solution to do that. Now, the problem is there's too many people that are EVM compatible and they have large migration budgets. So usually what we found in real life customer conversations is that people don't make migration decisions just based upon being better, faster, or cheaper. They say, who pays us the most? Whether it be Avalanche or Polygon or you know all these other guys, they they pay a lot of money for migrations to their ecosystems. So, you know, we don't do pay to play in the ecosystem. Maybe the community will want to do that with the treasury once it's unlocked. Uh, but right now it's mostly been conversations of natural migrations. And some people have done that and there's been some exciting things. Uh, but, uh, you know, just within our own organic ecosystem, uh, you know, 124 projects launched. And it's important to understand that they're built from the ground up because they're built on extended UTXO with Plutus, there was no code to copy. It's a radically different model. So that kind of developer velocity with a radically different model is definitely a really exciting thing. And it's a, it's a fun thing. And I think through the sidechain ecosystem, a lot more will, uh, will come, and especially when we start adding these low code, no code solutions like Marlowe and other things where you don't have to be a developer 
to be able to build stuff on the platform. It's super easy. It's paint by numbers. And then you add an AI layer like GPT, where you can have your code checked and you can kind of work, you know, in a pair programming style model with it. You can do a lot of stuff very quickly and get a formal proof that it looks well. And then a certification market can form where people can verify that what you've done is not harmful uh, and then certify that and it works its way in the DApp store. So I really like the direction that that ecosystem's going. AI. AI is the word of the year, the acronym of the year, maybe we'll call it. Um, this, so let's stay on that for a second. So first this, you know, you mentioned an AI system, that's kind of a de developer tool, right? That's not, that's nothing on chain, no, like finding DeFi primitive that you're, that you're working on. Um, it's just like a, an AI system to help write code. Yeah. And that's okay. where that market's going. If you look at the exponential progress that everybody's pushing and how these models are evolving, it's no coincidence that they're closest to the people who use them, which are engineers right now. So if I'm an engineer, you know, and I say, well, what's the use case of these uh, large language models? Well, maybe I should make myself more effective as an engineer. So maybe you can write my test cases for me. Maybe you can help me with documentation. Maybe you can help me audit my architecture of my application. Maybe you can write the GUI for me. You know, maybe you can help me design my APIs, these types of things. Well, because that's their area of interest and there's literally tens of billions of dollars, if not hundreds, going into this space, we're seeing a situation where in just a matter of months, you have doublings or triplings of efficacy of these types of systems in terms of workflow. And Microsoft, for example, is integrating this into GitHub. And they actually have a whole system they're building out to assist developers in just that. Google is doing the same with uh, DeepMind. So because these tools exist, we have to look to where the puck is going, not where the puck is at. And we know within a very short time horizon that this is now a permanent part of pair programming, where you as a developer, regardless of where your skills at, easy, moderate, hard development efforts are going to have an AI assistant working with you to check you. For me, it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to take a step back and say, okay, what's the lowest hanging fruit? You have the NFT space where you have a situation where you have a lot of very creative people that are doing amazing things, but they don't necessarily fully appreciate or understand the regulatory reality and the technical reality of the things that they're doing. For example, when you create an NFT, it is a legal artifact that has IP and it lives in a broader IP ecosystem. Well, how do you sort all that out? They have no language to do that. And then also when you look at uh, the technical side of things, they don't have the development skills to do things like royalties, complex multi-ownership models, securitize these types of things. So that's just a great example of where AI coming in at that level with a domain-specific language like Marlowe can really accelerate the process and allow a single person who doesn't have technical skills to actually do an enormous amount of work prior to handing it off to a bespoke company to finish it. So it massively reduces their cost of deployment and it helps check everything. And then what you do is just walk up the stack and you keep walking up the stack and you do more and more complicated things. And these tools will be capable of doing those complicated things and not 10 years, but within a 12 to 24 month horizon. So being the first to market uh, there means we can potentially leapfrog. And then all these complaints about how hard it is to code or developer accessibility or these types of things, uh, they're going to just fade to the wayside because you're going to get so much more velocity with this tooling that a small team, like three to five people can replicate what a 15, 20 person team is doing and get things to market much faster. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And everyone is, uh, I think everyone's pretty amazed with the pace at which AI is progressing. And, you know, the common refrain is, oh, why even learn to be a developer now? Because it's just going to be outsourced AI. But I think at some point AI is just going to allow everyone to code in the same way that everyone kind of learned to use Excel. AI is going to help everyone to learn to use Python overnight, right? Because it's, you have this assistant with you. Um, outside of developer tools, though, do you have any views on how AI might interact with blockchain technology, whether it be uh, distributed rendering or perhaps even serve as a way to verify authenticity of, of certain items? Because, you know, we're, we're kind of entering this world where we don't know what's, what's AI generated and what's, what's not. It's a great question. And, uh, you know, NFTs 
and identity solutions combined together with generative content um, can really give you a good sense of provenance. So if Midjourney creates something, you could automatically construct a verified NFT and it shows from day one the authorship and the IP trails. I've even heard of things like ownership waiting, where, you know, based on the training model where it got its inspirations from, you can do attributions and percentages uh, to various different people for royalty purposes. So I think AI can play a pivot, excuse me, blockchain can play a pivotal role in helping sort out the consequences of uh, generative AI, because that's going to have a, a tsunami wave of impact on creatives. Um, I mean, we're getting to a point within the next five to 10 years that you can sit down with a generative AI and say something like, okay, write me a song that sounds like a Beatles song, but have it sung by David Bowie. Uh, and uh, let's put a little bit of a Johnny Cash flair on it, and let's make the whole thing done with ukuleles. Uh, and then, okay, now that you've written the song, generate my album art, and then optimize the SEO and the description and the other things to be maximally viral uh, and upload to YouTube for me. Boom, it's done in two minutes, and voice AI is getting so good that, uh, that you know, it's going to sound like Johnny Cash and David Bowie, the ukuleles are going to be perfect and it's going to have the advantage of knowing every song ever written by every artist. And so when it puts it all together, there's a high probability that song's pr probably pretty good. And I mean, if you're Spotify, you're, you're licking your chops, right? You don't have to pay musicians anymore. Well, exactly. Uh, so, so it's a really interesting situation. So the question is, well, who owns that and how do you sort all that out? Verified NFTs in a blockchain-based system can actually potentially do that because they can uh, know where the sources of attribution go to from what trained the models and then weight the ownership accordingly so that royalties can flow through. Um, AI governance is another really interesting one. There's an AI project on Cardano created by a legendary AI researcher named Ben Gortzel. Uh, he created the OpenCog project. He's migrated from Ethereum to Cardano. It's one of the biggest migrations we ever had. Uh, and he's been building over time a very significant AI stack. I believe he's creating LLM plugins for that stack so you can be multi-model, but then he has a different view on how one would create an AI. I believe he's going to at some point create a side chain on Cardano called um, HyperCycle using a technology called Tota. And there, that's very interesting because we could actually almost do like an auto GPT style thing where you can say, okay, we can give it a goal, for example, parameter optimization inside the system, like our K parameter in the system or a min uh, parameter in the system, and just have it run for a long time and give us a lot of great feedback and output and be an advisory. One area where we are going to try to build the tools, we're creating a community grant program for the decentralized governance of Cardano. And one of the grants we're going to give out is specifically for AI assisting for our delegated representatives inside the system. So imagine if every congressman had an AI in their pocket that helps them govern. So basically the AIs can work with the DREPs and give them advice and kind of help steer decisions that they're making uh, so that they at least have better, more curated information and it helps normalize some of the knowledge between the different delegated representatives inside the system because some people be very advanced and some people not so advanced. So these are some baby steps into AI, you know, auto GPT for optimization goals uh, or something like it using singularity uh, stack, and then also AI assistance to aid in the governance of the, the, the situation. But then also we're very interested in um, intellectual property with verified NFTs for generative AI. That's another thing that we've definitely been looking at. Would love to be a fly on the wall of... Uh... The session where you're teaching our young Congress how to use language learning models. That would certainly be a sight. Um, it's it's happening with the 25 year old staffer who advises the no, of course, congressman. You know, it's just it, it's implicit instead of explicit, but it's certainly there. Of course. Um, so Charles, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. Um, there's just a couple there. So there there are a few people. Um, that raised the question about the regulatory landscape. Uh, obviously, you're a global organization, but do you have any view on, um, you know, the temperature uh, from developers as it pertains to the regulatory climate in the U.S.? Or do you just have any other views you would like to share as it pertains to regulation? Yeah, it's a very frustrating environment because it was going to get a lot better in 2022 and 2023, and then FTX created a scenario where it, it gets worse before it gets better. So what was happening last year was that there was this combination of many different ideas and eventually a consensus to get them passed. So Toomey, Senator Toomey had the Stablecoin Act, um, uh, Congressman Thompson had the DECA, 
Digital Commodity Exchange Act. Uh, there were things like Senator Lummis and Gillibrand's uh, Financial Innovation Act. You had Senator Stabenow's uh, act that she was pushing. So all these things were floating out there. And then the White House had written a very comprehensive all of government um, executive order on crypto. And we got to a point where there was enough raw meat to cook a pretty good meal. So what was happening was that behind the scenes, a lot of people were coming together and they were gradually getting to a point where there would be a compromise bill. And then the hope was to have passed that compromise bill sometime in Q1 of Q2 of 2023. Uh, and the flavor of its waiting versus red to blue was basically how well the Republicans did uh, in uh, November of last year. Then what happened was that FTX blew up and it became a very political issue because FTX was very connected to the Democratic Party. And apparently a lot of money had flown to them. So on the Republican side, they wanted to weaponize this to show corruption. And on the Democrat side, they had to go overboard in saying we had nothing to do with crypto and actually in some cases attacking the cryptocurrency space. So now what's occurring is that the dust is finally settling and we're starting to get to a point where we're talking again about a bill. The problem is that the political windows have changed a little bit. What was becoming bipartisan last year has become increasingly partisan. And so on the right, uh, you have people like Congressman uh, uh, not Warren, but uh, his name will come to me in a second, Davidson, uh, who is literally actually trying to fire the chairman of, this, of the Securities Exchange Commission and replace him with an executive director. Um, and and there's a, a very strong blockchain caucus there. And on the left, uh, you have people like uh, Elizabeth Warren who are raising money, saying that they're anti-crypto and anti-blockchain and doing everything in their power to make our ecosystem unwelcome, unwanted, including Operation Choke Point 2.0, which is a rehash of the original choke point that came during the Obama administration to basically unbank the entire cryptocurrency industry. So it's a difficult time and it's it's unnecessarily difficult because it's become political when it should have been a bipartisan consumer protection question. Uh, and it's likely going to take several months, if not the remainder of the year to work our way through it. The problem then is that we are now faced with 2024 being an election year probably the most polarizing election year in the history of this nation outside of maybe the 1860 election with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and, and so the, the the problem with that election is that we, we are going to have likely, if the polls are to be believed, Trump versus Biden for a sequel, uh, generative AI creating all kinds of fake news and uh, doing things and a lot of anger where people are living in parallel realities. This is not a productive environment for legislation. So regardless of where your politics fall, there's no incentive for the existing p command structure to pass a law. So if we can't get everybody together on the legislative side this year to pass something, then the next window would likely be 2025. So we could be in a situation of, of regulation through enforcement for another two years that will only get more vicious, especially if the SEC loses the case against Ripple. I, I do believe that this will precipitate and a, a more aggressive approach through uh, other angles like DeFi in particular. So in preparation for this, a lot of US companies that are blockchain based like Coinbase, like Gemini are already exploring offshoring. For example, Coinbase recently started a pivot to Bermuda uh, as is Gemini uh, going into offshore and uh, jurisdictions like Abu Dhabi and Dubai are trying to attract all these businesses. Abu Dhabi is setting up a $2 billion fund specifically to attract crypto businesses to come to their jurisdiction. And they've created a very permissive regulatory framework, which is quite good for ventures that are there. So there's definitely an exodus. There's definitely an uncomfortable environment and there's definitely incentives for that exodus. Uh, and uh, wherever this falls, it's, it's just gonna be a difficult year. And if we can't get it done this year, I don't think we're gonna get anything done next year. On that bright note, <laughs> Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. I guess if I could just put a pin on the regulatory stuff, uh, you know, I, I think I high level agree, obviously, in terms of how disheartening it is that um, it's become a partisan issue when, you know, on the right, you'd think they would be very pro capital formation and being a leader in, you know, all financial markets, you know, regardless of asset. And on the left, you think they would be interested in this technology that would disrupt big tech and big banks, but Unfortunately, that's not the scenario we're in. 
Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I do uh, still trust the courts. I think that we have the courts working in our favor. Um, so if it's if it continues to be regulation through enforcement, I think it's just going to be a thing where we have to grin and bear for a little longer. Um, Charles, want to thank you for coming on. Uh, before we go, uh, any any parting thoughts? Um, and where can people uh, follow your work uh, if they're interested? So for Cardano, cardano.org is definitely the place to go. Um, I also tweet a lot. I'm pretty famous for Twitter, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, so IOHK underscore Charles is my Twitter handle. I've got a million followers at Blue Check March, so you should be able to find that account. I say that because there's a lot of impersonation accounts uh, floating around. Uh, and just everything is okay. You know, as, as grim as it can be in certain pockets like the United States, Reality is that we have in the last 13 years as an industry completely reimagined and redefined everything from identity to finance to games. Uh, it's really cool. And uh, there is an acceleration of progress and of actors and we have plenty of capital in our industry. Uh, we're obviously not immune to the macro and when there's an economic decline, crypto also suffers from that. But all things considered, this still is one of the most attractive, fastest growing industries a lot of young, brilliant people in it, and uh, we're able to adapt and change uh, very quickly. So you'll notice something that the minute that a large language model comes out, we're adapting that. The minute a regulatory change comes out, we're adapting to that change. That's what you look for when you want to bet on the future. And I think we still will achieve the goal of becoming one global financial system where everybody's treated equally and fairly, as opposed to the nepotistic, corrupt, or a fractured system that we have today. Well said, Charles. Well said. Um, thank you again for coming on. We'll have to do this again soon. Uh, and thanks to all of our clients for um, tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You know where to reach us.